Hi, Lon. Hi. Thanks for taking the time. I hope your mediation went well. <laughs> Actually, it did. I think Mr. Welk decided that it was so important that we have this phone conversation that he and his folks got very reasonable very quickly. So. Awesome. Nothing like a little South Dakota drafting to get it. There you go. Settled. There you go. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, we had a little clarification, and I just want to make sure I'm correct that what you'd like them to do for the assignment is the pre-mediation statement, which is either like the attachment C or attachment D, depending on if they're plaintiff or defense, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Very good. All right. Tyler's going to start us out with a question, and then we'll kind of go around the room. As I mentioned, there will be a little space in between um, students as they come forward to the microphone. All right. Uh, hi, Lon. Uh, Tyler Matson here. Uh, the uh, question I had, I remembered yesterday that uh, you discussed how in South Dakota it's voluntary uh, if you want to take part in a mediation, but in Minnesota, before going to trial or uh, engaging in some sort of a trial, uh, kind or what have you, uh, you do ha you are required by law there to engage in a mediation. Um, the question I had with laws like uh, the one in Minnesota, in your uh, belief, is it your belief uh, a law like that would actually make? or leave the parties worse off, or do you think it's a uh, good law and it's beneficial to both parties uh, before uh, hanging to trial? Well, uh, I, I guess I, well, what I'd say is this. Uh, I mean, having been doing mediations as long as I have and having seen the, the net result of the mediation process, I am a firm believer in the notion that most, nearly all mediated settlements are for any of a number of reasons going to be far better than a trial result. And, and that doesn't just encompass necessarily the, the, the specific verdict, but the painful nature of the process to get to that verdict uh, I mean, litigation is incredibly stressful, in addition to being expensive. And uh, to, to the point that, in fact, I heard this said today by one of the attorneys up, up here, a guy named Bill Taylor, who is a pretty smart guy, and he's been practicing for a long time. He made the statement that a painful settlement beats a trial every time. So. Do, do I think that mandatory mediation would be good? Yeah, it, it would, particularly if it's going to uh, bring people to the table who otherwise wouldn't. But again, the caveat to, to, to the whole mediation process is that there has to be a legitimate desire on the part of, of, of the participants to, to really engage in meaningful settlement negotiations. If, if they're just going through the motions, if they don't want to be there, they really don't want to settle the case, then it ends up being a waste of time. But to the extent that the parties really are engaged and want to try to settle the case, then yeah, I, I, I think it's a great deal. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Summers. Uh, I know a lot of mediations can get really hectic when you add more parties. But what what is kind of your strategy for handling a mediation when you end up getting with a lot of parties and they start to kind of they just don't seem to come to an agreement with what they want to do? No set answer, but the depending on the problem, one of the common problems when you get multiple defendants or sometimes even multiple plaintiffs arising out of the same set of circumstances is that that they will start looking sideways at each other. In other words, one of the defendants is going to sit in, in the room and say, listen, I am only going to throw in if the other guy throws in two to one compared to me or you know whatever it might be, pick your, pick your number. But they end up 
saying I'm only going to do something if the other party does. And of course, the other party then a lot of times is going to say, well, no, that's garbage. I disagree with that. And if anything, he should be thrown in more than me. Okay. So th those sort of situations, when that happens or when you think it's going to happen, a lot of times what I I'll do the mediation on the line. In other words, I will put each one of the parties in a separate room. I will talk with them individually. I won't talk with them in a group context. I will solicit individual offers from each one of the defendants. Uh, and then after I've gone around to all the defendants, I'll add up the various collective offers, place that number, that global number, to the plaintiff. So the plaintiff won't know who's throwing money in. He'll just know how much money is on the table. I uh, get a reduced demand then from the plaintiff, and then I'll go back and I'll start over, and then I'll I'll tell everybody, well, look, now the gap has gone from a million eight down to a million four. That's the work that we need to do. Now let's go back and we'll and I'll continue soliciting individual numbers from everybody and keep whittling down the gap by doing it that way. And so what, what happens then is that each one of the parties focuses on only one thing, and that's what is it worth to my particular client to buy my piece, as opposed to doing the comparison game with the guy in the next room. Keeps people from looking sideways, keeps them focused on nothing but their own interests, and, and that's a, a way that I use very commonly to try to, to, to get settlements and to broker settlements if you've got multiple parties who are going to start looking at, at each other and, and, and insisting that one do something as a condition to something else going on. It, it makes, obviously it makes the, the, the mediation much more cumbersome, but it really does work well, it really does work well. And, and I guess, Frank, you know, the other thing they do at the end then is, well, once we've got the settlement, again, nobody knows what, what anybody has done except themselves, so I have them all send their checks to me. I draft the release, I have them send their checks to me, and then once all the checks have cleared, then I issue my trust account check to the plaintiff. And so the defendants don't even know what the collective amount of the settlement was. All they know is what they've contributed to the package. Plaintiff doesn't know who contributed what, but he knows how much he got, and that's about it. Hi, Lon. My name is Christian. I was just, um, I guess, wondering, do you, sub do you keep in your office, um, separate from everything, all of your files for mediation? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I, I still keep my office here at the firm. I, I don't practice law anymore, but I still run everything through the firm. I'm still a partner in the law firm. So what I, I, I do is I, I keep out in a filing cabinet outside my office, have the current mediations, the ones that are coming up, uh, along with those which don't settle necessarily on the day of the mediation, and so we keep kind of plugging away on them. I, I keep those outside my office as well. But other than that, I you just file everything the, the, the way that we would typically file any closed file. So do you have to keep mediation files for a certain amount of time, or do you ever purge them? I, I don't know what our office purging policy is, frankly. I think it might be 10 years, but yeah, we'll, we'll purge them, but it, 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 it's a long time down the road. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You, you need another one, though. Oh, I have a list. Uh, <laughs> Hi. I was wondering what mediators do to become more versed in, like, the substantive law issues that you guys are asked to address, particularly if you didn't practice in that area of law. 
Uh, it, it sort of varies from case to case. I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, I've been practicing long enough that there are not very many areas that I don't have at least some basic familiarity with. So from a legal standpoint, most of the time I, 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 I'm already familiar with, with the issues. So I, I don't tend to get too caught up in and don't have to generally spend a lot of time learning the law. When that does happen, though, typically the attorneys are going to lay out for me the statutes, the cases, and some of those things. And so if I need to get familiar with those, I can read the statutes and do those sort of things. And if they cite a case, I'll read the case. But by and large, that's not necessary. What is, is more important as a mediator it is not necessarily what the law is, but some of the factual background of the claim. That's probably the single most important part of what goes on in a mediation is taking particular facts, whatever they may be, and using those as the basis for uh, changing expectations and modifying expectations as you're going through. Thank you. Hello, this is Ashley Tanner. I'm a 3L. Um, you mentioned yesterday, um, kind of in a jokingly manner, I guess, that uh, people who go into mediation are burnout trial attorneys. Uh, can you <laughs> can you maybe describe a little bit how your um, stress levels have changed since becoming a mediator? It has gone from probably well, when you when you're a trial lawyer, uh, you. You're, you really do live with it. Uh, I've never slept very well in my life, but when I was trying cases, uh, I would, when I'd go to sleep at night, the last thing that I would think of would be one of my files. First thing that I would think of when I woke up in the middle of the night would be one of my files. And so I'd think about that. I kept a notepad by my bed stand. And you, you just sort of live with things. Uh, and, and that's just the, the way that, that, that life is when, when you practice law when you're a trial lawyer. It's, you just don't ever get away from it. Now that I'm doing what I'm doing, the stress level has gone from eye level down to my ankles. It's a little bit like mowing the yard for me. Uh, if, if you get a litigation file, if it gets done in a year, two years, that's pretty quick. I had litigation files that went on for, you know, a couple of them. I mean, almost ten years before they ran their full course. Now I go in, I do a mediation. It takes a day. Sometimes it takes two days or maybe a week to get the mediation done. But but you're done, and then you move on to the next one, and it, it's uh, it, it's just a much much from a personal perspective, it's a pretty good gig. Thank you. Hello. My question Hi. kind of rolls off that. I was just curious if there was anything in particular that you missed about being a trial attorney or the pace or anything like that. Uh, in, in terms of the pace, I, I tell you, I, I actually work more now that, than I did when I was doing trial work. I mean, I literally do work seven days a week. Uh, I, I typically am in a mediation every day of the week, Monday through Friday, and I spend Saturdays and Sundays then reading the files for the upcoming week and, and getting ready. Uh, I also do a whole lot more traveling now than, than I was for a while as well. Uh, I've mediated cases in, you know, Chicago, Detroit. I get to Minneapolis a lot. Uh, out in Seattle, I did a death case down in Albuquerque. Uh, I, I mean, so I, 
I've, I've gone a lot, and I actually, as I said, I work a whole lot more than I, I ever did in terms of the pace when I was trying cases. Uh, the, 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 the level of the work, though, the stress level is obviously way down from when I was trying cases, that that's the, the, the good side. Do I ever miss what I did? No, I mean I think about it briefly at on occasions and see the guys here in the office. In fact, one of them, as we speak, one of my partners is trying a case that had been mine uh, and w which I handed off to him once I started doing all of my mediation on a full-time basis. So he's covering for me on that trial, and I'd have to tell you that I don't really miss it. I mean, it's an exciting, really exciting way to practice law. I could never be a transactional lawyer, uh, but I, I don't miss the, I mean, it's it's hard, hard, grueling work to be a trial lawyer, and I don't miss that part of it. Hello, my name is Ashley, and I have a quick question for you, kind of dovetailing off of some of these other questions. So. Um, mediation or being a mediator is a more common uh, next step for a trial attorney but I'm wondering if you could talk to us about opportunities for those of us who um, are going to be transactional attorneys who might want to uh, become a mediator later on if those opportunities exist in South Dakota or just opportunities that you potentially see um, for that. I would expect that those sort of transactional opportunities will present themselves. It's kind of like everything else. Uh, mediation really did start out as an offshoot of litigation, but as we discussed, it's becoming pretty commonplace with commercial transactions, some of which may not yet be in litigation. Uh, the, the divorce area that we talked about is another specialized area uh, that 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 there is, even now, there's a need for that. Uh, so to the extent that you've got some experience in divorce work, family law, th those sort of avenues, avenues are already open. And my guess would be that as time goes on, some of the rather specialized national sort of cases, uh, there, there will also be a need for those. Now, South Dakota, of course, I mean, one of the problems you're going to confront is this. Uh, we're not a big state, and so those sort of opportunities are going to be a little bit more limited in South Dakota, I would expect. Uh, I mean, a broad-based mediation practice, obviously there's plenty of work in South Dakota to maintain the sort of mediation that I do. That, that The kind of specialized transactional sort of mediations, you're probably going to at least now, if, if you wanted opportunities in that, you'd be looking at going to maybe Minneapolis or a Denver or someplace like that, but where there would be more of an opportunity to, to conduct that sort of specialized mediation. Hi, my name is Kyle Chase, and 3 l My question is, uh, when you're preparing for to do a mediation, uh, what factors do you consider when you decide like what type of mediation to do, whether that be uh, facilitative or evaluative or you know? Typically, I, I don't make those sort of decisions until I'm I'm in the mediation because it depends a lot on the circumstances of the individual mediation, personalities, and, 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 and those sort of things. Uh, so you, you just don't know how you're going to have to approach a particular mediation most of the time until you get there. Now, the, well, one of the exceptions to that would be if in advance of the mediation the attorney tells you, hey, I'm going to have this particular problem. Uh, w with my client or I anticipate a, a particular problem that might call for more of a facilitative approach, uh, then you can focus on that. Or, or it, it may be one where uh, the, the attorney tells you that the client thinks that he's bulletproof and so he needs somebody to come in and throw some cold water on 
uh, his attitude toward the risk of a trial, in, in which event then you're going to come in loaded for bear from the evaluative standpoint. But most of the time, you don't have those sort of uh, indicators in advance. So you just react as it goes on. And typically, every mediation that, that, that I'm in is going to have some elements of both. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Lon. My name is Jenny, and I have a question about um, the assignment. Is the defendant sure. Custer Touring Company or the Custer Touring Company's Insure. The, the defendant is always the touring company. The, the insurance company is typically not a nominal defendant. The, the insurance company is involved only because it is the insurance company for the defendant. And under the policy of insurance has a duty to, first of all, defend the case, pay for the attorney to defend the case, and then secondly to provide indemnity for any judgment up to the amount of the policy limit. So while the insurance company is a huge player in the process, obviously, because it's going to write the check, it is not a nominal party. Custer Touring is the, the, the defendant. And, and the, the, the jury is never told about insurance. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you mentioned insurance in the trial, and you're running the risk of getting a mistrial. So while everybody knows that insurance is a part of life, it's not a word that ever comes up in a trial. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few questions from students who aren't present in class today but emailed them, so I'll just ask. Sure. Uh, first of all, regarding the assignment, what provisions do you expect to see in our pre-mediation statement letters. Are you expecting students to lay out the key law in the given area and give an estimation on the type and amount of expected damages? Or do you want us to focus on detailing provisions of the letter such as intangibles, statement of the case, etc.? Both <laughs> is the short answer. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I mean, you'll, you'll glean from the, the, the fact statement, I mean, there's plenty of stuff there to go around for, for both of you, depending on whether you're a plaintiff or representing a plaintiff or representing a defendant. And, and so consistent with what we had talked about yesterday uh, in, in terms of the outline, and if you're looking for a format, obviously the, the, the uh, exemplars that I gave you guys as attachments, while it, they outline a very, very different factual scenario than, than what you guys have, both do lay out kind of nicely the, the format, if you will, for any mediation statement. That is, you're going to have an introduction, say who you represent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lay out the facts, lay out the law, identify the damages, identify the status of negotiations. And, and then deal with the intangibles in some fashion as we discussed, because some of those things are going to be areas that you're going to feel comfortable perhaps talking with the mediator about in the mediation statement. Others are issues that you're not going to be able to raise in the mediation statement, because remember, you will be providing in literally every instance a copy of your pre-mediation submission to your client. And, and there are going to be perhaps some sensitive things that you may need to talk either about, but which would create some potential problems with, with your client uh, if, if he or she knew that, that those were part of the pre-mediation statement, those intangible things. So they should include any intangibles, like on a separate page that they would address with you privately or whatever? They, they can do it on a, a separate page, Marilyn. They could do it maybe even just with an asterisk or a footnote that would say, listen, here's an, an additional issue. Uh, here's how I, I would handle it were this a, a real-life situation. Right. Okay. 
Another question is, uh, you mentioned how parties may submit pre-mediation documents either confidentially or mutually. In your experience, do you find that a mutual exchange of pre-mediation documents are more or less likely to lead to successful and quick settlements of disputes? It depends on the circumstance, but by and large, mediation statements that are exchanged uh, in advance of a mediation are going to help the process. Uh, and in fact, in, in, I, I go back to, to the construction case that I'm going to be mediating in a couple of months. Uh, but where there's been no discovery, and there are 14 parties, and I know that there are going to be all kinds of guys who are going to be saying, not me, and pointing fingers. In, in that one, I laid out for all the parties as a condition of the mediation that they would provide me with a copy of a mediation statement, but that everyone would exchange their mediation statements with everybody so that everyone would know what everybody's expert was saying and all those sort of things so that we wouldn't get to the mediation and have somebody be surprised and say, geez, I didn't know about that. I can't, can't factor that in. Um, another one is, how many of the cases that you mediate fail to settle? Is it common for you to do multiple rounds or multiple sessions worth of mediations in order to get a common case settled? to settle? Okay, all kinds of questions there. <laughs> I, I don't keep statistics on how many settled, but I, I would say that it's well over 95% of the cases do settle. I, I mean, it, it's very rare that cases don't settle. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they settle on the day of. Most do on the day or, you know, whatever time you have allotted for mediation, whether it's two days or three days or whatever. But at any one time, I would say that I have six, eight, ten, maybe a dozen cases that, for whatever reason, did not settle at the mediation. And so I will typically follow up with letters and phone calls, and I always have my phone with me, so I get calls on nights, and I get calls on weekends uh, as we try to bump things along over the telephone. Uh, and so if you're not able to get the things settled on the day of, typically we can get them done, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe a month later, by continuing telephone conversations. Sometimes it becomes necessary to actually have a, a, another formal mediation caucus. And, and we'll, so we'll do that on occasion as well. Uh, but but that's more the exception, and, and, and normally I, I've found that you're able to continue negotiations and get things done over the phone uh, even after the initial mediation conferences, and you, you don't quite get close enough to put it to bed. Okay, I've got one more here. Um, you mentioned that it is normally an incentive for parties to mediate while motions are pending with the court. Then you gave an example about when a judge can cross his or her order to give a little bit to all of the litigants and compel mediation. How often does this actually occur in practice? Uh, well, in, in, in terms of the motion practice, not very often. Okay, the, 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 the most typical response from a judge will be, I'm going to withhold a decision on your motions until I know the case is not going to settle. And in fact, I frequently get phone calls from judges asking me, where we're at on a particular case if it didn't settle. Uh, because I'm supposed to be getting a decision out, are you going to get that thing settled or do I have to start working on it, etc. So the, the, the most common occurrence will be that the, the judge will, in fact a lot of times on a motion, they'll just, in, in, including the one today, 
that the parties had all agreed that they were going to stay everything. And so Judge Kornman up in Aberdeen has been waiting to see what happens on this deal. And they're all going to get together now tomorrow and get on a phone conference with the judge and tell them, okay, we're done. So the judge doesn't have to worry about any of the, the handling any of the, the matters that are before him. That that's by far the most common. Uh, the, the instance that I was talking about was one where we had tried to mediate it, made some progress, and it, everything just sort of fell apart then. And so then they started taking depositions and filing some uh, motions after that. After the motions all got filed and they had their hearing, and the judge asked, oh, by the way, have you guys tried to mediate this thing? They told him, well, we did, and it didn't quite work out, uh, so we felt we had to do this. And so the judge asked them if they were where they were going to go from here, and they said, well, we, we don't know. It's going to depend on your ruling. So rather than telling them, listen, I'm going to hold off on the ruling, he went ahead and he made his ruling, and, and as I hinted during the class yesterday, gave some scraps to everybody, but also planted some risk with everybody, and then his closing sentence was, now you've got my ruling, now go get this thing settled. That doesn't happen very often, but the point being that regardless of how the judge handles it, whether he holds off on a ruling uh, or however he might do, the most typical response of the judge is going to be that of encouraging settlement negotiations. And by and large, you'll find that they're going to be very amenable to doing whatever the, the, the attorneys might think would advance the process. Okay. I have one question. Do you have a favorite organization that you get continuing legal education from in the area of mediation or a resource in terms of publications or anything? Probably the one that, that I use the most is the uh, National Association of Distinguished Neutrals. That, that they've got, that they send out publications and uh, uh, they have some pretty good seminars. Uh, the Harvard Law School also, uh, I, I uh, subscribe to a service that they have on negotiation and, and that has some pretty good uh, our articles as well. So those are probably the two that, that, that I uh, subscribe to the most. Great. Thank you. Any other okay. questions? I think, I think we're out of questions, Juan. Thank you so much for taking the time again today. And Glad to do it. And, and I guess what, what I'd say, Meryl, is if, if anybody else has any other questions, get a hold of you and call me or email me or whatever and I'll I'm happy to help out if there's something else that comes up. Okay, thanks so much. Perfect. Okay, thanks everybody.